friends. We are members of the Holston Conference General and Jurisdictional Delegation. We want you to know we consider it a high honor and a serious responsibility to represent you during these crucial times for the United Methodist Church. We have prepared this video to provide a quick and basic overview of some recent developments within the process of seeking a way forward for our denomination. We hope you'll find the content clear and helpful as we participate in conversations that will shape the future of our church. Let's begin with a little history of how we came to this historic moment. One of the things uniting us as United Methodists is how we interpret Scripture. We look at Scripture through the lenses of tradition, reason, and experience. And yet we also find ourselves divided as a United Methodist by how we interpret Scripture using tradition, reason, and experience. The differences in interpretation of Scripture as it relates to human sexuality have become a distraction for some, a passionate mission for others, and an obstacle for our entire denomination. Increasingly, we find ourselves struggling to discern a manner through which we can faithfully witness together. Like any family turmoil, this did not happen overnight. It has been going on for years, and with each passing general conference, it has become our main focus. At the 2016 General Conference in Portland, the conflict over LGBTQ inclusion reached its boiling point after simmering for more than four decades. In 1972, language was placed in the discipline stating, homosexual persons, no less than heterosexual persons, are of sacred worth, and that we do not condone the practice of homosexuality and consider it incompatible with Christian teaching. In 1976, funding restrictions were put in place to prohibit church funds being used to promote homosexuality, and language was also added to the discipline indicating that we do not recognize relationships between persons of the same sex as marriage. In 1980, a specific reference to homosexual unions was removed from our social principles, and the statement that marriage is between a man and a woman was added. In 1984, the statement that self-avowed practicing homosexuals could not be ordained or accepted as candidates for ministry was added to the discipline, and fidelity in marriage and celibacy and singleness was explicitly identified as the standard for clergy. In 1988, statements intentionally affirming God's grace is available to all and we are to be in ministry to all persons were added. In 1996, the prohibition against clergy to perform same-sex unions was approved. In 2000, a statement was added to our social principles that we implore families and churches not to reject gay or lesbian members. In 2004, 2008, and 2012, the debate continued. With each general conference, talk of division and splitting increased. In 2016, the conflict over full inclusion of LGBTQ persons had reached such an intense impasse, the General Conference asked the Council of Bishops to set up a special commission. This group was comprised of leaders with diverse perspectives from diverse parts of our global church. Their mission was to work together to find a way forward. Their work began in autumn of 2016. The Commission has now presented their proposal to the Council of Bishops, and this is what will be presented at the Special Call General Conference in February in St. Louis, Missouri. Now that we've considered the history and context of our deliberations, let's turn our attention to the implications of the three plans put forward by the Commission on the Way Forward. For the purposes of this video, we'll share the major impacts each plan will have on our annual conferences, our local churches, and our pastors. Let's start with the One Church Plan recommended by the Council of Bishops. Overall, the One Church Plan acknowledges different views of human sexuality within United Methodism. The One Church Plan places the power to decide whether to ordain LGBTQ persons within the voting practices of the clergy sessions of annual conferences. Bishops will not be required to ordain LGBTQ persons against their conscience, but they will be charged with finding another bishop to perform the ordination if the candidate is approved by the clergy session. The Council of Bishops would also remain one body rather than splitting. Regarding congregations or candidates who wish to exit the denomination, the current disciplinary processes would remain in place. In the One Church Plan, local churches would have the option of whether to allow same-sex weddings on their campuses and whether to receive an LGBTQ clergy person. 
Along similar lines, clergy would have the right to decide whether to officiate same-sex weddings or not, and there would be an end to the threat of church trials of clergy persons who officiate same-sex weddings. Now let's consider the traditionalist plan. The traditionalist plan maintains and strengthens current language in the discipline prohibiting same-sex marriages and ordination of LGBTQ clergy by adding stricter enforcement of these policies. Under the traditionalist plan, annual conferences would have to certify they will enforce the discipline. Annual conferences refusing to do so would be encouraged to join with other like-minded annual conferences in forming autonomous affiliate or concordant churches rather than remaining full members of the United Methodist denomination. Similarly, active and retired bishops would need to certify they would uphold the restrictions within the discipline or they would no longer be compensated for their expenses. For local churches, the traditionalist plan would encourage local churches with a traditionalist perspective to remain within United Methodism even if their annual conferences leave to form an autonomous affiliate or concordant church. In this model, local churches would not be required to vote. They would vote only if they disagreed with the stance of their annual conference. Local churches with a traditionalist perspective in more progressive annual conferences that were leaving the UMC could vote to remain fully in the UMC and affiliate with a nearby UMC annual conference. Likewise, local churches with a progressive perspective in traditionalist annual conferences would be encouraged to leave the denomination and join an autonomous affiliate or concordant church. In the traditionalist model, clergy who believe in full LGBTQ inclusion would be encouraged to join an autonomous affiliate or a concordat church. Clergy remaining in United Methodism who fail to comply with the disciplinary restrictions would be subject to church trials at which the mandatory minimum penalty for conducting a same-sex wedding would be a one-year suspension without pay for the first offense and loss of credentials for the second offense. If just resolution is used instead of a trial to resolve a complaint against a clergy person, Person for performing a same-sex wedding, then any just resolution must include a commitment not to repeat the offense. The One Church Plan and the Traditionalist Plan, which do not require constitutional amendments, do require a vote of 50% plus one of the General Conference. However, the Connectional Conference Plan includes multiple constitutional amendments requiring two-thirds of the General Conference vote and ratification by a two-thirds aggregate vote within annual conferences and central conferences. The Connectional Conference Plan creates three connectional conferences within a larger umbrella denomination known as United Methodism. The Connectional Conference would include a traditionalist option, a progressive option, and a centrist option. Under this plan, jurisdictions would first decide which connectional conference to affiliate with, then annual conferences would choose whether to remain in the connectional conference of their jurisdiction or to choose another connectional conference for themselves. Finally, local churches would choose whether to affiliate with a different connectional conference than their annual conference. In this plan, clergy credentials would reside within the connectional conferences. Clergy would have the possibility of affiliating with more than one connectional conference. The Book of Discipline limits the business of a special session of the General Conference to only those matters which are in harmony with the stated purpose of the call. The discipline does allow consideration of other business by the special session, but requires a two-thirds vote of General Conference delegates to do so. Because the original call from the Council of Bishops was for a special session to hear and act on the report from the Commission on a Way Forward, there was a question about whether the 2019 General Conference could consider petitions other than those attached to that report. The issue was presented to the Judicial Council, and the Council ruled that the General Conference could consider additional petitions, which are in harmony with the stated purpose of the called session. Any organization, lay, or clergy member of the United Methodist Church may submit a petition for consideration by the General Conference. The deadline for filing petitions for the special session was in early July. All petitions that were sent to the General Conference Secretary before the deadline have been reviewed to ensure that they meet the technical requirements of the Book of Discipline. And now they will be further reviewed by General Conference leadership to determine which ones are in harmony with the stated purpose of the called session. Those petitions will form the basis for the legislative work of the special session. All proposed legislation must be translated into the official languages of the General Conference before being distributed to delegates.
The Council of Bishops made special provision for early translation of the Commission's report so the delegates would have as much time as possible to study it. Other petitions to be considered at the special session are being translated and will be distributed shortly after Thanksgiving. The Council of Bishops has asked the Judicial Council to review the petitions submitted as part of the Commission's report and offer a declaratory decision on the constitutionality of the three plans currently proposed. The hearing on that request is scheduled for October, so delegates should know well in advance of February whether the Judicial Council considers any aspects of those plans to be unconstitutional. General Conference is a legislative body. That means that all reports, petitions, and resolutions that come onto the floor are subject to debate, deliberation, procedural motions like amendment and substitution, and ultimately a vote of yes or no. In the end, there really is no middle ground in legislative action. When a vote is taken, a proposal is either accepted or rejected. The possible outcomes for the called session in February are one, the approval of one of the Commission's plans without any changes, two, the approval of one of the Commission's plans with amendments or substitutions, including the possibility of combining parts of two or more plans into something new, three, the approval of an alternative plan that comes to General Conference as a separate petition or through the procedural process of substitution during floor debate or four, the rejection of all proposals, which would leave the current language of the Book of Discipline intact. If an alternative, amended, or substituted plan is approved, it is likely that the Judicial Council will be asked to review it and rule on its constitutionality at the conclusion of General Conference. In Holston and other conferences as well, people are asking delegates how we make the decision to vote yes or no on particular legislation. The question takes various forms. Does the delegation vote together as a block? Are delegates required to vote in a way that follows the sense or the desire of their annual conference? Can an annual conference direct its delegates to vote for or against particular legislation? The Judicial Council has considered the authority of an annual conference to direct certain conduct of its general conference delegates and has reasoned that since delegates to general conference are traditionally and historically elected by their annual conferences without instruction, then they are only bound to do as their individual consciences dictate for the good of the church. I think what that means is this. When those of us who are delegates are deciding how to vote on a particular proposal, we take into consideration a variety of factors, including what we have heard from our own annual conference through participation in sessions like the one you are attending today, what we have learned during the process of floor debate and deliberation at General Conference, and what we individually discern God is leading us to do based on our understanding of Scripture, guided by tradition, reason, and experience. One thing is certain. We need your prayers. Now, more than ever, congregations across Holston and around the world need to be people of prayer, particularly for the future of the United Methodist Church, that we might be united in mission, ministry, and spirit for the glory of God's kingdom. Thanks be to God. We want to thank you so much for taking the time to join with us in these important conversations. We would simply ask for your continued prayers for the delegation as we continue toward General Conference. And we would want you to know that we continue to hold the churches and the pastors and the people of Holston Conference in our prayers. <laughs>